This year's Navy birthday theme, Victory at Sea, focuses on the Navy's accomplishments in the Pacific theater of World War II. To that end, I'd like to tell the stories of three World War II sailors and focus on the traits that helped them in their most challenging moments. While there are many character traits that we could discuss, I believe these qualities are some that tend to stand out. These qualities are responsibility, bravery, and perseverance. These traits and the stories that accompany them give us cause to be proud of our Navy's history and heritage. Only through remembrance can we attain the pride necessary to give our own modern fleet value and meaning. The first character trait I'd like to discuss today is moral responsibility, which has served the Navy well during its 245 years. Although there are many examples of moral responsibility, few are as obvious as Admiral Mark Mitcher. During World War II, Mitcher commanded the Fast Carrier Task Force in the Pacific. In June 1944, the American and Japanese fleets clashed in the Battle of the Philippine Sea near the Marianas Islands. The battle was a decisive American victory that nearly eliminated the Japanese Navy's ability to conduct large-scale carrier operations. The Battle of the Philippine Sea was the largest carrier-to-carrier -carrier battle in history and became known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot a nickname created by the American aviators to emphasize how many Japanese aircraft they shot down. Mitcher's moment of moral responsibility came on the second day of the battle. The Americans had already destroyed 300 Japanese planes on the first day, and now they wanted to wreck the enemy carriers. Around 4 p.m. on June 20th, a plane from USS Enterprise sighted the Japanese fleet about 275 miles away. This was very long range, especially considering only three hours of daylight remained. If Admiral Mitcher decided to launch his planes, he could afford no delay if he wanted to get those planes back before dark. Attacking at such a distance, some planes would have insufficient fuel to return. If the attack took longer than anticipated, the pilots would have to land on their carriers after dark, something for which they had rarely trained. Mitcher had little choice in the matter. If he didn't send his planes out, then further pursuit of the Japanese fleet would be impossible because his ships needed to refuel the next day. So at 4.30 p.m., the planes launched. Altogether, Mitcher's task force sent up 226 aircraft. After several hours in the air, they arrived over the Japanese fleet at sunset. They sank the carrier Higyo, badly damaged three other carriers, and sank two accompanying oilers. As the planes turned back to the American fleet, they flew in the pitch dark. Although night recoveries were rare, standard procedure was for carriers to display their deck and ramp lights for night landings, even though this might reveal the ship to lurking submarines. Mitcher, however, took this to another level. He ordered the carriers to flash their signal lights and point a searchlight beam into the sky. Cruisers and destroyers also turned on their lights and fired star shells to illuminate the area. One pilot said that the scene looked like a Hollywood premiere, Chinese New Year, and the 4th of July all rolled into one. None of the pilots expected Mitcher to illuminate the fleet like a Christmas tree. They expected to find only darkness. In the desperate hours of World War II, they believed Mitcher would keep the fleet's lights off to ensure its safety. Veterans of the Battle of the Philippine Sea fondly remembered Mitcher for turning on the lights upon their return that night. Years later, pilot Donald Flash Gordon remembered this action. Just as all hope seems lost, Grim Reaper Flash Gordon sees the impossible. The destroyer escorts of the U.S. fleet. One by one, the little gunships turn on their bright searchlights marking the way back for their fellow sailors in the sky. And then some destroyers had been sent out to meet us, and their searchlights were up, and home is that way. I'll never forget. In the 
weekend, 80 planes were lost due to lack of fuel or in landing accidents during this event, but only 16 pilots and 33 crewmen were lost at sea. The rest were rescued. Because Mitcher felt morally responsible for sending these men out in the near darkness and bringing them home at night, he put the rest of his fleet at risk to get them home safely. The next character trait I'd like to talk about is bravery. This event took place at the Battle of Leyte Gulf in October 1944. This battle was important because if the Japanese had been successful at Leyte, they would have destroyed General Douglas MacArthur's army, preventing it from reclaiming the Philippines and likely changing the outcome of the war. Instead, the Allied victory at the Battle of Leyte Gulf left the Japanese with such heavy losses that the Japanese Navy did not sail in comparable force ever again. Ernest Evans was commander of USS Johnston, a destroyer commissioned just a year before this major battle. At his ship's commissioning, Evans stated, this is going to be a fighting ship. I intend to go in harm's way. And anyone who doesn't want to go along had better get off right now. As if to underscore the danger of his invitation, he added, now that I have a fighting ship, I will never retreat from an enemy force. During the ship's first year of service, Evans and his crew gained a reputation for going above and beyond the call of duty, protecting Marines in battle. For instance, Evans often ordered his ship so close to shore that Japanese troops hit the vessel with small arms fire. His bravery and leadership set his ship apart. And when his crew met an overwhelming enemy force off the island of Samar and Leyte Gulf, his men helped the United States win the largest naval battle in the world. On October 20th, 1944, the Johnston's crew joined the 7th Fleet's Escort Carrier Task Unit, known as Taffy 3. Taffy 3's duty was to protect the northern approach to Leyte Gulf. The Battle of Leyte Gulf was actually composed of four separate engagements, but the one that involved Taffy 3 was the morning engagement fought off the island of Samar. In the early morning hours of October 25, 1944, Admiral Takeo Kurita's Japanese center force moved toward Leyte Gulf. This force consisted of four Japanese battleships, eight cruisers, and 12 destroyers. Under cover of darkness, it had reversed course and exited through the unguarded San Bernardino Strait. Unwisely, Vice Admiral William Halsey had withdrawn his battleship task force from the strait the previous day, leaving only Taffy 3 to protect the waters off Samar. If Korea's ships made it to Leyte, MacArthur's Sixth Army might be trapped. Taffy 3 was the only force standing in the way. The moment Korea's fleet came into view, geysers from Japanese shells flashes, some in brilliant colors because of dye markers the Japanese had used, began erupting near the U.S. ships. Everyone in Taffy 3 knew they were in for an uneven match. Under Commander Evans' leadership, USS Johnston became the first ship to lay down a smoke screen and open fire as the vastly superior enemy force approached. When Johnston got within five-inch gun range of the heavy cruiser Kumano, she unleashed more than 200 rounds and 10 torpedoes at the Japanese ship. Kumano was hit with several five-inch shells and at least one torpedo, which blew off her bow. Thanks to the efforts of this small destroyer, Kumano was taken out of action. But enemy shells from the Japanese ships soon rained down on the Johnston. The destroyer was severely damaged and suffered high casualties. Evans was seriously wounded. Despite the damage, greatly reduced speed, dwindling ammunition, and no remaining torpedoes. Evans ordered the Johnston to launch a second attack on the Japanese fleet in support of several of the U.S. escort carriers. Limping along on just one boiler, Johnston managed to fire nearly 30 rounds in 40 seconds into a 30,000-ton Japanese battleship. Lieutenant Commander Bob Copeland, skipper of the USS Samuel B. Roberts, Recalled the moment that the Johnston limped past his ship. A seriously wounded Evans continued calling orders down a hatch to the after steering compartment, where sailors were turning the ship's rudder by hand. When Evans saw Copeland, 
he waved. Johnston continued to take on Japanese destroyers, bluffing them into thinking the ship still had its torpedoes. After two Japanese ships turned away, the rest broke off to get out of Johnston's gun range. But this charge marked the end of Johnston's two and a half hour battle. Surrounded by Japanese ships, his destroyer dead in the water and with no boilers and no power, at 9.45 a.m., Evans finally made the call to abandon ship. Within 25 minutes, the destroyer rolled over and began to sink. Of Johnston's crew of 327 men, only 141 survived, a casualty rate of 43%. Evans was among those lost at sea. At the time, there was debate among Johnston's survivors about their skipper's fate. Some believed he was killed by an enemy shell during the evacuation, and others claimed he managed to find his way into a damaged motor whaleboat before dying of his wounds. Whatever his final moments, Evans posthumously received the Medal of Honor for his actions. His citation reads, seriously wounded early in the engagement, Commander Evans by his indomitable courage and brilliant professional skill, aided materially in turning back the enemy during a critical phase of the action. His valiant fighting spirit throughout this historic battle will venture as an inspiration to all who served with him. Bravery. Ernest Evans possessed plenty of it, and he gave his life during the Battle of Leyte Gulf to protect the fleet in the midst of a terrible war. This battle was fought by a group of sailors who did not expect to live long enough to see the afternoon. Ernest Evans was one of those who did not. The bravery of those men allowed the Battle of Leyte Gulf to become a major victory for the United States when it could so easily have been an incredible defeat. The final character trait I'd like to discuss today is perseverance. Radioman's second class, Jack Leeming, was just 22 years old when he was taken prisoner by Japanese forces on March 4th, 1942. During an air mission over Marcus Island, Leeming's plane was shot down. Both he and his pilot ditched in the ocean. Despite several valiant attempts to paddle their way out to sea and into the path of American search planes, the waves pushed their raft ashore, where they were caught by the Japanese garrison. After a thorough interrogation, Lee Mean and his pilot, Lieutenant J.G. Dale Hilton, were loaded into an unmarked prison ship and sent to the Japanese home islands. They were far from their own lines, and as fate would have it, they would have to wait 41 long months to be rescued. Over the next three years, along with his fellow inmates, Lee Mean endured all manner of privation. Interrogation occurred regularly, as did malnutrition, bouts of diarrhea, dysentery, and beriberi, torture, beatings, injuries caused by unsafe working conditions. All of these were the order of the day. After moving through several POW camps, Leeming was sent to the city of Toyama, where he and his fellow POWs were forced to work as stevedores, unloading soybeans, rice, and scrap iron. It was at Toyama where Leeming experienced his closest brush with death. The guards accused him of stealing rice and sentenced him to close confinement. He remembered the ordeal vividly, saying, we were immediately beaten and then imprisoned. We were placed in a cell less than a meter wide and three meters long. Here we remained for three days. It was July. Our cell was in a small wooden building, a tool shed in the sun. It didn't have any ventilation, it was stifling. There was room in the cell for one man to lie down, one to crouch, hugging his knees, and one to stand. We rotated our positions as each of us tired. At one end was a hole used for answering calls of nature. As it was summer, the odor emanating from it was difficult to tolerate. Somehow, Leeming and his companions survived the nightmare in the tool shed. After three days, they were released and returned to work. Leeming was freed by the Americans on August 14, 1945. 
It was only through his perseverance that he survived his time in captivity. He said this about his experience. We endured hunger and humiliation and lived as animals. We became passive and detached in an effort to survive. Becoming a prisoner of war can break your spirit and you can lose a part of yourself. It's difficult to forget. It leaves a scar that stretches as far and as deep as the mind and imagination can travel. We were in constant danger. POWs were tested by means other men know little about. We persevered with dignity and loyalty to our country. Why did Mark Mitcher, Ernest Evans, and Jack Leeming do what they did? Mark Mitcher felt morally responsible for the men he sent into battle, taking the chance that the rest of his fleet could be attacked when he turned on those lights. Ernest Evans bravely put his ship in harm's way, protecting the rest of the American fleet and giving up his life in the process. Jack Leeming endured treatment that would have broken a lesser person, and yet, he never gave up. These men were motivated by their love of country, their fleet, and their fellow shipmates. Without individuals like these, the US Navy would not have such a rich history or cause to be proud. But it does. And that's why every year on the Navy's birthday, we mark October 13th as a sacred day. It's a day when we remember what others have done and what others have sacrificed. These daring sailors have imparted to us a legacy of glory and service. It's up to all of us to carry it on. Let us strive to remember the Navy's unflagging moral responsibility, its historic bravery, and its stoic perseverance, and use those lessons in our own lives so that we may continue the legacy of responsibility, bravery, and perseverance for another 245 years. Thank you.